All right, well, um, <clears throat> we've been talking for weeks about renewing our minds and the flesh versus the spirit and um, different issues like that about renewing the mind. And then I moved last week into discovering who we are in Christ. And um, I made a comment last week that I need to apologize for because I said something along the lines of, I'm concerned some of these topics are going to be a little bit lame. And I don't want lameness. Who wants to hear a lame teaching, right? I don't. And sometimes when I read about, uh, it was just reading the other day, <clears throat> about um, sanctification and, and justification and you're righteous, you know, through this and that. And it, it, you, you get reading and it's like, it wasn't the Bible, it was somebody's commentary. It's just like, blah, 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 blah. All these big words that just are like, what does this really mean practically? And, and I want to be able to sink my teeth into it and be interested and fascinated. And, and this, I don't know, this theological monologue was just too heady and not applicable to life. And that's what I was referring to. However, I have been diving into sonship. And, you know, we, we've all read the scriptures about, oh, if you be sons, then you're heirs, and join heirs with Christ, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. And all this. We've read it, and I've read it. I, I keep saying this every week, 24 years. I've been studying the word, and things are just absolutely coming alive for me. It's like I'm just at this point in in that sanctification process, in my journey, as we all get to that place at different times in our journey where everything's just kind of blah, blowing up and so exciting that I'm grabbing my head and saying, Jesus! <laughs> I'm just overwhelmed by what he's teaching me. And so I didn't sleep well last night because I had stuff typed out and I was going to teach it and I'm dreaming about riding a motorcycle through a town and I'm hitting, hitting like roadblocks and trees and things because I know how to drive, but the motorcycle wasn't something I was able, that, that particular motorcycle, I couldn't drive it. And it's like God was saying, okay, you're getting this, you're getting, that, you're, you're getting this and you're starting to put it down, but you need to teach what you really know and not jump into stuff yet that you have this, ah, oh, all these things are coming together, but they're really not together yet. I can't articulate it fully and connect it all yet. It's just, to me, from what I'm seeing, is so deep and so exciting and life-changing. So I'm going to teach what I know, and then in the coming weeks, I will know more, and I will teach more. So thank you, Lord, for your word. And we ask that you bless it, Lord. We know that your word is full of your anointing, that it's alive and full of power, God, and we trust, <clears throat> Lord, that you will make that word alive to our hearts. By your Holy Spirit, God, just guide your word into our hearts today, Father. Open our eyes, Lord, so that we can see what you want us to see. So we can hear, God, what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name. All right. Well, the earth is waiting. The earth is waiting. All of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be manifested in the earth. Waiting for us to exercise our legal rights as sons and daughters in the earth, our legal right to authority. Romans 8.19, if you want to turn to Romans 8, that's where God has had me. And I mentioned Ephesians last week. You definitely need to be reading Ephesians because it just goes hand in hand. But the Lord has had me in Romans chapter 8. Oh, opening all this stuff to me. So verse 19 of Romans 8 says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. <clears throat> the creation. If we don't praise God, what will cry out? The rocks will cry out if we don't praise God. God created creation. He made creation. And he's saying that the earth, creation itself, is waiting. And as if there's life in it. As if, you know, and he said the trees will clap their hands and, you know, the rocks will cry out and... There's, there's life, not, not that rocks have a spirit, obviously, they don't even have a soul. Like animals, you know, at least have a mind. But the creation, the earth, everything on the earth is waiting, eagerly expecting the sons of God to be revealed, for us to be fully manifested, fully disclosed who we are and what we are 
Everything's waiting with eager expectation and anticipation to see something come out of you. To see something reacting within you. Something happening in your life. God has this element of authority that he's given us on the earth. We saw it in Genesis as we've looked through. Um, Adam and Eve were given authority to rule and reign over all of creation. And of course, they, they lost it. They dropped the ball. And Jesus came, redeemed us, and gave it back to us. So now we've got it. And creation is waiting for us to exercise this authority for the sons of God to be revealed. Now that includes daughters, because it says in Galatians that there is in Christ neither male nor female, neither slave nor free. We're all one in Christ. So when you think sons, think daughters, too. So the word sons <clears throat> in the Greek, this is from the Strong's Concordance, and uh, if you go to biblehub.com, you can click on the Strong's and get some amazing, amazing um, parallels and explanations. <clears throat> Properly, the word sons means a son by birth or adoption, right? We've been adopted. We know in Ephesians we've been adopted in, in Christ. Figuratively, it's anyone sharing the same nature as their father. We are sons and daughters because we share the same nature. We are like God. Now, you need to get excited. If you're not excited yet, I need to keep talking about it. You have the nature of God inside of you. You are like God. You've been made in his image. You are, as it says in different scriptures, like little gods. David said it. Jesus quoted it. And I'm not going to get into that. And that can sound heretical. But it's not. It's in the scripture. Because we're just made in God's image. We're like him. We, we're walking around talking, moving, interacting with the very nature, the ways, the thoughts of God inside of us. We're carrying God. Just as somebody walks around carrying a virus that can spread, we, on the other hand, in a good, in a good way, are carrying the nature of God wherever we go. So if you go to a store and you're interacting with people and you're talking and you're touching them, you're shaking their hands, you have to remember that you've got the very nature and the ways and the thoughts and the life of God on the inside of you. So that's something that we think we have, but we don't have a revelation of, I'm saying. We, we, we know it, but we don't know it. Because if we knew it, we would be a little bit different. We would act differently. It would... Um, it would motivate, it would, it would push forward different actions, different words, different looks on our faces, different reactions. If we really knew the nature of God was on the inside of us, it would come out of us more. Once we have a revelation, it's more than just knowing, it's a knowing. It's a joining of spirit and soul together, it's a knowing. So, <clears throat> for the believer, becoming a son of God begins with being reborn or adopted in Christ by the Heavenly Father. Another part or facet of this definition is that the word son emphasizes the likeness of the believer to the Heavenly Father. The likeness of the believer to the Heavenly Father. Resembling his character more and more by living in faith. Resembling his character more and more by living in faith. Now, when I just read that, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we live by faith. Faith. It has so much to do with living in faith. The word faith is actually God's in right, in rot persuasion. It's being fully persuaded that what God has said he is able to perform. Being fully persuaded, that's what faith is. That what God has said, he is able to perform. He will do it. So when I'm walking through life and I'm just expecting God to do things, and I have no doubts because I'm feeding my faith, which is starving my doubts to death. That's how we, that's how we build our faith. We feed our faith, and it starves our doubts to death. They die. Eventually they die. And we, we can be in this place where we're going through life and it's frustrating because we're not getting ahead, we're not moving forward in faith, and we're not gaining ground like we feel we should, but it's just a matter of time. It's, it's sanctification. It's going through the journey. It's living life with God. 
and trusting him every step of the way so that eventually that faith is really big and really strong and there is an inwrought persuasion in your heart, in your spirit, where you just know. You know God is going to bring things to pass. So this sonship has to do with just trusting God and believing God, an inwrought persuasion. I am fully persuaded. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, principalities, powers, nothing will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. There is no, I am fully persuaded. Abraham was fully persuaded that even though he was 100 years old and Sarah was almost as old as him, God could produce a baby from them. Even though their, their bodies were as good as dead, God can do the supernatural. So sonship has to do with the supernatural. Sonship has to do with God being God through us, in our lives. It's not just, yeah, now I'm in the family of God, and I'm adopted, and I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God. <clears throat> it's, not, it's, not, it's not just that. That's just on the surface. That's just the, that's just the cover of the book. There are chapters to be discovered about sonship. What does it mean to be a son or a daughter of God? It's deep. There is an inrot persuasion that will come in time as we exercise our belief in God and our, 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 our dominion as sons and daughters. <coughs> Excuse me. Another facet of the word sons is that it highlights the legal right to the father's inheritance. It has to do with the legal right that we have to our father's inheritance. As the believer lives in conformity with the father's nature or purpose. <clears throat> so, sanctification. The journey we, we go through throughout life. <clears throat> there is a conformity that we experience over time. A conformity with the father's nature or purpose. And that develops the faith or the inrot persuasion. It's pistis in the Greek. Inrot persuasion comes through time as we, as we go along this journey. And we become conformed to the Father's nature. Romans 12.2 talks about not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's the renewing of the mind. We've got to renew our minds in order to go through this journey successfully and be conformed to that inrot persuasion, to have that. <clears throat> the word conformed means to be molded by pressure. To be molded by pressure. Don't be molded by pressure in this world, in the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. On the other hand, we can be molded by pressure to that inrot persuasion, that faith, as we trust God. We can go through circumstances, we can suffer trials, we can go through hard times where we have to trust God, and that is molding us by pressure in a good way. To have that inrot persuasion of faith, that is how it is developed. And as I look back over the past 24 years of being saved, I see how the pressure was coming, and like at first it seemed like it was doing nothing. But in time, there was, there was a molding, and there was a creating in my life that created an inrot persuasion, a knowing of God, a depth of who God is that I didn't have at the beginning, that none of us had at the beginning, because we didn't know him. And over time, we've, we've gotten to know him. So that there's this thing that's like that, that pressure, that diamond being formed in the earth. Remember, we, we talked about that weeks ago. There was a diamond being formed in the earth, and it gets pushed up to the surface by basically lava. Well, in our lives, that, that pressure is forming gems within our spirit man that then will come out as we touch people, as we talk to people. His life, the life of God, the nature of God coming out of us as we interact with other people. <clears throat> Okay, let's go now to Romans chapter 8, and let's look at verse 5. This is what we've been covering, but open your hearts, open your minds to embrace what this is saying. <clears throat> Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There's the renewing of the mind. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. 
The sinful mind is hostile to God. You remember we defined that one week? The sinful mind, the nature of the flesh, absolutely hates God. It's hostile. That's what the word hostile, it's in the Bible. That's what the word hostile means. Your sinful mind, it says there's bad blood, there's loathing and hatred toward God. So that's how, why we've got to renew our minds. We've got to force our minds to conform to what the Word of God says so that we force it into obedience. It's still going to hate God. It's just the sinful nature. It's going to hate God, but we're going to force it into obedience by training it. We can train. We train our kids, right? We train our kids. We need to train our minds. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, Romans 8, 9, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, and he is, if Christ is in you, <clears throat> your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. So I want to look at that verse. Let's break it apart a little bit. If Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. What does it mean for your body to be dead? Is your body dead right now? Physically, no. In reality, like physically, our bodies are alive, right? We ate, we ate breakfast this morning, I'm talking, you're breathing, our bodies are alive. The word dead is the word necros. Sounds like necromancy, talking to the dead. So in the Greek, it's necros. It means figuratively, not able to respond to impulses. So your body is dead, not able to respond to impulses. So what impulses do you think it's not able to respond to? The spirit, the impulses of the spirit. Unresponsive to life-giving influences or opportunities, inoperative to the things of God. That's what that means. I've always wondered why, like, I mean, you know, we know it's figuratively, my body is dead, but it's not dead, it's alive. It can't respond to the things of God. It's inoperative. It can't, it, it, it just can't receive the things of God. My body is dead to God, in essence, dead to the spirit world. Yet your spirit is alive. And the word alive is zoe. It's the life of God. If you've ever, ever heard of like Kenneth Hagin teach on that, it's the life of God. It always only comes from and is sustained by God's self-existent life. So I know this is a lot of words, and this is kind of deep, and it's not like stories and examples. So you're going to have to really focus to get this. I, I want you to get my excitement. And I I've been studying this for hours and hours, so I'm going to try and get it across to you, okay? <laughs> yeah, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. It's alive. It sustains by God's self-existent life. It comes from God. My spirit is alive only because of God's self-existent life. Because his, he is alive and he has life to give and he has given me his life. So to, to get that, realize that in your spirit you have the life of God. You have God's very essence and being and life within your spirit man. In fact, let's just say, repeat after me. I have... I the life of God, life of God within, me. within me. It is inside of you. So wherever you go, you've got the life of God. So your spirit is alive because of righteousness. So what does righteousness mean? This is cool. And I've always heard it taught as it's right standing with God, which is true. But that doesn't excite me. <laughs> the word righteousness means judicial approval. A verdict of approval. It's like you got put on the, on the stand, you were in court, you were judged, and God says, I approve of Natalie. I approve of Jake. I approve of Alex. I approve of you. I approve of you, Steve. You are approved by God. The approval of God, the definition of approval, the belief that someone or something is good or acceptable. You are acceptable, Milton. You are now acceptable. God has made you acceptable, Chelsea. You're acceptable. 
I am no longer unacceptable. I am no longer rejected. I am no longer put out on the stones to die. I am acceptable because of God's righteousness. If in, but if in Christ, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. My spirit is alive to God because God has made me acceptable to him. So in Christ, located in Christ, that's where I am now. If you read Ephesians, we are in him because we've said, Jesus be my Lord, and you did the work on the cross. I'm now in him. I'm part of him. I belong to him. That's where I'm located in Christ. He has made me acceptable. He has put his stamp of approval on you, on me, and said, you are acceptable. You are loved. You are okay. You're acceptable. You, he, he went, you went to court and he said you are acceptable. He approves of you. Another part of that definition is what is deemed right by the Lord after his examination, what is approved in his eyes. He has examined you. He has examined your life and he says you are approved. I accept you. Now, not the sinful part. Our bodies are dead because of sin, right? But our spirits are alive because of righteousness, because God has approved of us, because of what Jesus did on the cross, not because of what I did, right? Not because of what you did, because of what Jesus did. And that is why I'm found in him. And that is why there are so many scriptures that say, in him, you have this, and in him, and you have that, and in him... It's in him. It's like hiding in him, being clothed in him. That's why I have authority. That is why I can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And the, re the reason I doubt when I lay hands on the sick and think they're not going to recover is because I'm thinking I don't have what it takes. I'm not approved. I don't, I, I'm just me. But when I realize and get a revelation of the fact that I am in him, that I'm clothed in him, I've been put on the stand, and he said, I approve of this person, they are okay with me, they're in my family, they are found in me, then it's his power upon us that's doing the work. Then it can do the work, it can do it, because now I have that persuasion. I have faith. That's what faith is. It's an in-wrought persuasion. And it's not something I can try to believe and believe and believe and believe and believe, but it doesn't work until God, at whatever point in time, you know how Jesus said in the scripture, like, this was his appointed time when the, when the time had fully come. You know, Christ did this. Well, when your time fully comes, and it won't fully come unless you seek him, unless you read your Bible, unless you're a doer of the word, unless you're constantly pursuing and going after him and going through the trials of life. And it, it says in Romans, as we suffer with him, which is, you know, it's just going through life. It's, it's going through having to be patient, having to be kind, learning to tithe. It's going through life. As we suffer with him, we will also be glorified with him. Then we'll see the manifestation of the sons of God, the daughters of God, walking in our true authority of how God has created us and designed us to be. There, there's a place he wants to take us where we all dream of it, right? Do you dream? I know you dream of laying hands on the sick. I know you dream of, of pursuing God's pursuits and doing what he has for you. We should be dream. If you're not dreaming, if you aren't dreaming about that, you need to start dreaming. You need to start using your imagination. Remember Aaron Costello talking months ago about imagination? has to do with the renewing of the mind, dreaming about laying hands on people, dreaming about talking to someone, a cashier at Country Fair, and, and having that person just break down in tears because the Spirit of God all over you is manifesting himself and impacting that person. If we don't dream about it, we'll, we'll never hit it. We'll never reach it. You know, we, we aim high, and maybe we'll hit low, but we'll hit if we don't dream about anything, you're going to get exactly what you're dreaming about. Nothing. We've, we've got to dream. We've got to get excited about God manifesting himself on earth. <clears throat> now, there was a time in my life throughout that journey of sanctification when I would dream big dreams. But it was about me. 
it, it was, it was, there were prideful dreams, you know, those associations with those dreams, the thoughts associated were, look at me, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be something, I'm going to be up in front of all these people and things are going to happen and, and really the thought behind it was, I'm going to get glory. I didn't say that, but I know that, I know that was the motive of my heart. But then you get to a place where you suffer a little longer <laughs> And God works that out, and then you can dream dreams, and he can manifest himself through you, and then it's for his glory. So think about where you're at. Where are you? First of all, are you even dreaming? Second of all, when you start to dream, what's associated? What are the motives in your heart associated with those dreams? Why do you want God to do these certain things? And let him work whatever he needs to work in your heart and out of your heart to get you to that place. <clears throat> so, this chapter um, goes on to talk about being an heir, and we're going to get to that another week. Um, so let's just go, we're talking about righteousness, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. <clears throat> In the New American Standard Bible, it says that he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, was, didn't sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we're talking about righteousness. In Romans 5, 10, excuse me, it says that our spirit is alive because of righteousness. Because of what Jesus did, did, God put a stamp of approval and said, you are approved. You are okay. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, became sin. He became sin itself. He didn't just take our sins on his body when he died on the cross. It says that he became sin. He knew no sin on our, be sin on our behalf. He became sin. He, be, he became sin itself. He took it all and became sin so that he could trade places with us. We were sin and sinful and he traded places. On the cross, he traded places. Substitutionary sacrifice is what it's called. So that we could become the righteousness of God in him. There's that in him again. Located in him, I am in him, I am now the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay, so get that. I am, you are the righteousness of God. You're not just righteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. The approval of God in Christ. So repeat after me. I am, I am the righteousness of God, righteousness of God in Christ. In Christ. You are his very righteousness. You, you are the essence of righteousness walking around on the earth. Okay, so he made him who knew no sin. The word sin <clears throat> means to miss the mark. It's from, originates, I think, like, well, missing the mark has to do with something about a French, do you know, a French term uh, about archery, missing the mark. I'm not sure, I heard that years ago, but yet this is Greek, so... Forfeiture because of missing the mark. You know, you, you, you're ready to let go of the arrow, you let go, and, and you, miss, you miss the bullseye. Well, sin means we missed the bullseye. We didn't hit where God wanted us to hit. We missed the mark. Um, it's a brand of sin that emphasizes its self-originated or self-empowered nature. What does that remind you of? It's a one word and it starts with an F. Self-originated or self-empowered nature. The nature of the flesh. Yes. Sin has to do with the nature of the flesh. We've been talking for weeks about the nature of the flesh and how the flesh wants to do certain things. And the flesh hates God and the flesh is so awful. But then we've got the spirit. And we're trying to renew the mind, which is flesh, so that it agrees with the spirit. So that our words, the words that come out of us, will be spoken out of our flesh because it comes out of our minds but will agree with the spirit, be in agreement there. So the word sin has to do with the flesh. It's not empowered by God, and it is not a faith. It's, it's not a faith in his inworked persuasion. So again, the creation 
waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The creation is waiting for us to get a hold of the fact that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. That I am righteous. I may feel bad. I may feel like I've done things wrong. I may feel evil. I may feel like I'm hurting people and, and doing all these things. And I may be doing those things. But in reality, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. In my spirit, who, is, who I really am, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. It can be a little hard to wrap our minds around because we're so used to living in our flesh. Because we walk around expressing ourselves through our flesh. But yet our spirit is supposed to gain the ascendancy. Our spirit is supposed to be the stronger of the two. How do we get our spirits to become the stronger of the two? Feed our spirit. Exercise, Exercise our spirit. Being a doer of the word. A doer of the word. So we're feeding our faith and we're starving our doubts to death. Working on that in rot persuasion, letting it grow, letting it get bigger and bigger until we believe. It's a fact that I am the righteousness of God in Christ, but until I believe it, it's not going to do me any good. I have to believe it. I have to know it. And I have to walk out of that place in him. I need to walk from there. I need to move from that place. Everything has to originate from that belief in that place that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So in the last few weeks, I've talked about idols. And how if we have idols in our lives of things we just can't live without. If I can't live without that thing, it's become an idol. And therefore, it's stronger than God. And it's been taking the place of God. So, <clears throat> we need to be identifying those things and measuring them against this righteousness that we are. Measuring them against where we really are in Christ. Who we really are. And just continue identifying those areas so they can be dealt with. If you don't identify them, they can't be dealt with. Well, that's time. And I have so much more, and it would come together, and I'd be able to explain things, but we're out of time. And, yeah. All right. So, Father, we thank you for your word. And, Lord, I just pray that, Lord, everything I said today, Father, that was from your spirit, God, that would continue to work in our hearts, Lord, that it would continue to build and make sense, Lord, and come together, Father, in full understanding within our spirit man, Father. I just, I just thank you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit will take what was said and transform it within our hearts, Lord God, so that we have understanding so we can walk in what you want us to walk in, Lord. We thank you, God, for your goodwill toward us, God, that you have called us approved by you, Father. That we are your masterpieces, God. That we are your works of art. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for taking us up higher to think your thoughts, Lord. And to understand from your perspective, Father, and not from ours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.